All right, welcome today to Vera Christian Church, and we have a lot of guests here, first-time guests, and we especially say thank you for worshiping with us. We hope this feels like home to you, and we have some who've been away for a while, out of town, who are, are back worshiping with us. We'd like to welcome you back also. You know, few people in public life are as openly hostile to Christianity as media mogul Ted Turner. He once said, Christianity is a religion for losers. He blamed his divorce from his third wife, Jane Fonda, partly on her decision to become a practicing Christian. Turner was a deeply religious boy. He intended at one point to become a missionary. But when he was a teenager, a younger sister, Mary Jane, contracted a form of lupus and suffered terribly before dying a relatively short while later. All of his prayers for her recovery, he said he prayed an hour a day, were for nothing, so he concluded that the Bible is not true and that God is not real. I think all of us from time to time are going to face some challenges to our faith. And we have to decide, we have to come to a point where we decide, do I believe in God and do I believe in the Bible as His Word? And that challenge, it may be some experience like Turner had. It may be the death of a family member that rocks our world. Or it could be becoming estranged. Or it could be a financial problem. Some injustice in our life. Or it might even be a doctrinal issue. Does the Bible really say that? Does it really teach people outside of Christ are going to spend eternity in hell, for instance? And at that point in time, we're going to have to decide, do I or do I not believe the Bible? One of my spiritual mentors he would often begin a teaching with this statement. He said, long ago, I made the decision to accept the teachings of the Bible as absolute truth, no matter what the subject, no matter how much pain it causes me, no matter how much I would like for it to be otherwise, and no matter if I am in the minority, and no matter how much it costs me. Say yes to the Bible. That's our theme today. Now, we're in this sermon series, if you're new to us. A sure word to a shaky world. Solid. We talked about several things, but today is solid Bible. We want to say yes to the Bible in that sense, which I just read. And, and that may mean different things, but I'm going to look at three different things that means this morning. First of all, we want to say yes to the Bible's origins. The Bible's origins. In Romans 3, 2, writing about all of the Old Testament, Paul refers to them as the very words of God. The Old Testament, the very words of God. And then in 2 Timothy 3, 16, Paul says, all Scripture is God-breathed. So the first issue we need to settle when it comes to the Bible is, do we believe the Bible is a book from God or is it a book from man? And in a way, it's kind of a trick question. You know, it's not necessarily either or, is it? It's a, it's a false choice because it is both a book from God and it's a book from man. But we need to make sure when we say that, it's a book from man, what we mean by that. What do we mean when we say the Bible has human authors? It was just, it was written by people. People just like us, they were often writing from their experience and their thoughts. And someone might automatically jump to the conclusion, well, that means the Bible must have mistakes and it must have errors in it because to, to err is human. So if it has human authors, there are errors and mistakes. But that's a false choice as well. Although to err is human, it doesn't mean to be human is to err always. Remember, Jesus also had a human nature. Jesus had a fully human nature, but he never erred. He never made a mistake morally or ethically or otherwise. And you say, well, yeah, but Jesus also had a divine nature. And that's true. And that's the point. As while the, the Bible does have human authors, it also is God-breathed. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And that means as these authors were writing and communicating, the Holy Spirit was operating to ensure that what they wrote was true and accurate and without error. After all, it's God-breathed and God cannot lie. 
And therefore, all of the Bible is authoritative for us. I took a little graduate, postgraduate work at Cincinnati Bible Seminary, and they had this statement in their catalog. We believe that all Scripture, as first written by the authors themselves, was produced under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Scripture is therefore the Word of God in written form and is infallible and inerrant in its entirety when taken in the original meaning of its authors. Now, infallible means incapable of error, and inerrant means without error. Thus, it is the sole and sufficient rule for faith and practice. And that's important to recognize because some people, they want to distinguish between what are the human parts and versus what are the divine parts, and we're only under the authority of the divine parts and none of the human parts, but all of it is inspired of God. And as we make these distinctions, we also want to remember that there is, there's a meta theme to the Bible. So there's a lot of subplots and there's a lot of personality that comes through. The human authorship, which is good, that's part of what helps to make it engaging. The Bible is engaging because we love people's stories. We love human stories. And one of the definitions of preaching, for instance, is truth through personality. The personality comes through. My life group this past week, we started with kind of an icebreaker question that everybody went around and answered. You can do this for lunch after church today. But the question was, if you could invite anybody throughout all of time in history as a dinner guest to your table, who would you invite? All right, that was the icebreaker question. We were going to go around. First person we started over here was Sunshine Carter in our class. And Sunshine says, she said, before I give my answer, she says, I bet I can answer for you, Steve Jones. And I had already thought of somebody. And I said, okay, go ahead. And she said, Elvis Presley. And that was who I had thought of. <laughs> and I said, I don't have a man crush on Elvis or anything, but I, it's intriguing. And I said, how did you know that? She says, I've been listening to you for 15 years. <laughs> I know. Preaching is truth through personality. So is scripture. It's truth coming through personality. You read Paul personality of Paul comes through. Same with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You study them enough, you can see they have different personalities that are coming through. But it's still the truth of God. Uh, the Quran, for instance, is put forth as having been dictated to Muhammad from God, and it's just these and thous, and I've read the whole Quran. It is difficult to get through. There's not a lot of humanity in that book. The Bible is engaging because of the human element as well as the divine element. But I began to say meta theme. There's a meta theme to the Bible. There's many subplots, but an overarching plot. So remember the movie Princess Bride? Maybe many of you have seen this movie. And the Princess Bride is about a grandfather who's going in to his grandson who's sick and in bed. And he brings a book with him. It's a story that's been handed down in their family from generations called The Princess Bride. That's the story he wants to read. Now, the little grandson doesn't think he necessarily wants to hear a romance story. He wants to hear adventure, something with no kissing. But grandpa convinces him to listen for a while and begins to read the story. And it concerns Buttercup. She's the, the Princess Bride. She's engaged to marry Prince Humperdinck, but she doesn't love him. She still is in love with Wesley, who was her one true love, supposedly had passed away five years earlier, and he had been a farmhand at her home. And she would boss him around and tell him to do stuff. And whenever she told him to do something, he would always answer, as you what? As you wish. As you wish. And she came to realize that was his way of saying, I love you. So the story is read, and, and the grandson gets more and more engaged in the story, and finally it concludes. They come to the end of it, and there's this poignant scene at the very end of the movie. It's just the last 60 seconds that I want to show you right here. Pay attention to the end of this movie.
Anybody need a hanky? <clears throat> Every single word in the Bible, not all of it's revealed, but it's all inspired and it's all the Word of God. And God is using these authors to communicate this message, this meta theme, as you wish. I love you. That's what God is saying through this message in the Bible. Remember that. All right, so say yes to the Bible's origins. It's human, but it's a book that is also divine. Number two. <clears throat> say yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. We got like a spittoon around here? Oh, I got there. Communion. <clears throat> say yes to all of the Bible. Say yes to all of the Bible. So not just to part of the Bible. All of the Bible, as we said, is, is inspired. But some people, some people, believe it or not, try to make distinctions and say some parts of it are more inspired than others. For instance, the, the words of Jesus. We know that Jesus came to teach us and to show us how to live. And in some versions of the Bible, uh, it's written, his words are written in what color? Red. Red letters. Those are the actual words of Jesus. And they say, well, yeah, I'll submit to the authority of Jesus. I'll follow his teachings. But Paul, I'm not so sure. And especially because Jesus was more general in some areas, maybe uh, having to do with gender or marriage, whereas Paul gets a lot more specific. And some of the positions that the Apostle Paul takes and the other apostles in the letters of the New Testament are more specific and less politically correct. Whereas you may be able to take the words of Jesus and find a few loopholes, not so much the rest of the writings of the New Testament. And so people say, well, Paul's just writing his opinions, but what Jesus said is the actual word of God. And that's where we can get into a little bit of trouble. We, say, we want to say no to that and say yes to all of the Bible is equally inspired. Because listen to what Jesus said. Speaking of the red letters, speaking of what, look at what Jesus said about the writings that were going to come from his apostles. In John chapter 14, verse 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Now that's not a promise to you. The Holy Spirit is not teaching us all things, not directly, not bringing to our remembrance everything that Jesus said. We want to know what Jesus said. We need to read the Bible that the Holy Spirit inspired. This was the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the apostles. Jesus continues in John 16. When he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. So when the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul and the other apostles, the other prophets to write the New Testament, he was taking that message from Jesus Christ. If we want a New Testament where the words of Christ are all printed in red, you want to print the whole thing in red. It's all the word of Christ. It's all equally authoritative. The apostles recognize this. Paul even said in his writings, let you receive these writings, not as the words of men, but as the words of God and the word of Christ. Now we do need to make sometimes in good interpretation of the Bible, we need to distinguish some cultural aspects between that and that which is transcultural. We need to do that. But a lot of times, the motive for finding some cultural issue is that we're dealing with something that's not politically correct today and we want to find a loophole. So make sure we're very careful when we make those kinds of distinctions. Eric Liddell, the Flying Scotsman, was an outstanding athlete in 1924. He'd earned a spot on the track and field team for Great Britain in the 1924 Paris Olympics. But then he shocked everyone by refusing to run the 100 meters, a race that experts favored him to win. He withdrew because the qualifying heat took place on a Sunday. And Liddell, a devout Christian, refused to violate the Sabbath, which he considered Sunday to be. So Liddell chose obedience to God and his word over his best shot 
at Olympic gold and glory. Can you imagine an athlete making a decision like that today based on his devotion to God and to God's Word? I mean, if that was you, how would you feel? Would you feel cheated? God not allow you to run on a Sunday? Well, listen to what Eric Liddell said during that time. He said, quote, Since I've been a young lad, I've had my eyes on a different prize. Each one of us is in a greater race than any in Paris. And this race ends when God gives out the medals. End quote. St. Augustine said, If you believe what you like in the Bible and reject what you do not like, it is not the Bible that you believe, but yourself. So say yes to the Bible. The Bible's origin. Say yes to all of the Bible. And the third yes. Say yes to a perspicuous Bible. A perspicuous Bible. The Hebrew writer says, God has spoken to us. Do you believe the Bible to be perspicuous or ambiguous? I see a lot of blank stares out there. Maybe we can figure out what it means just by the way I use it in that question. Perspicuous. Uh, perspicuous means clear, ironically. To say that the Bible is perspicuous is to say that it is clear. The Protestant reformers, they used to talk about the perspicuity of the Bible. And they were talking about its clarity. You say, Steve, why didn't you just say, say yes to the clear Bible? Because I like to give you a word that you might be able to win in Scrabble every once in a while. So that'll be a game changer right there. But they were, and it just makes us think a little bit. They would say that because at that time, the Catholic Church was teaching that the Word of God was so deep, so mysterious, and so hard to understand that you had to have the church to explain it to you. In particular, the clergy. At the time that William Tyndale lived, it was against the law to teach children the Lord's Prayer or the Ten Commandments. It was against the law. Church leaders believed it was their job and their job alone to interpret the Bible for the common people. The Scriptures were only available in Latin. Nobody spoke Latin. But William Tyndale loved God's Word. He wanted it to be available to everyone. He had a mission to translate the Old and New Testaments from the original Greek and Hebrew into English. So all the English-speaking people could read the Bible for themselves. If you have an English Bible today, you can thank William Tyndale for that. Now, he ultimately paid for it with his life. Tyndale's desire for all people to read the Word of God in their own language caused him to be labeled a heretic by church authorities, and he was martyred. On October 6, 1536. But his last words were a prayer. Lord, open the King of England's eyes. That's what he prayed. And that prayer was answered the following year when King Henry VII authorized the Scriptures to be translated and printed in English. All right, that's not our issue today. Catholic Church got the services in English and the Bible in English. But there is a philosophy that does communicate this idea that you can't understand the Bible. And it's called postmodernism. And the hallmark of postmodernism is relativity, that there is no absolute truth, that everything is relative. And when that's applied to the Bible, what a postmodernist philosopher would say, and our culture is inundated with it, is that human language, because, uh, by its very nature, because there is interpretation involved, human language is inadequate to communicate ideas anything for certain. If I'm telling you something, I may mean something in particular, but as you're listening, you may not be able to understand what it is that I'm saying. When you read the Bible, there's no way to understand for sure what Isaiah was saying, or what Jesus was saying, or what Paul was saying. It's all a matter of interpretation. What it means to you, what it means to me. There can be no sure word coming from the Bible because of the nature of human language. It's all ambiguous. Now, I ran into this. You may think, is that really a thing? Oh, it's a thing. There's a few years ago, a lady called me from Orlando. I was living here in Vero Beach. She called me from Orlando. She was in the church that, where I had preached back then a few years ago. We'll say her name is Becky. And she wanted me to perform the wedding ceremony for her son because we had good relationship. And can you drive back to Orlando to do the wedding? I said, sure. And we communicated with various emails on the details of the wedding. But as 
we were corresponding, it came out, Becky was no longer going to church. Other than a belief in a higher power, she didn't believe in the God of the Bible, she didn't believe in Jesus, she wasn't a Christian, none of her kids were, because of her influence on them. And this that we're talking about right here was her issue. Right? The, this, this idea, she said, Steve, human language, how can we know anything for, about God for certain? How can we know when we're reading the Bible that we're understanding what they originally meant? How can we know anything about Christ? It's just human language is inadequate to communicate any solid idea for certain. And I said, Becky, now listen, Becky, you and I have been exchanging emails here for several weeks, and we have come to an agreement on several details about your son's wedding, where it's going to be, what is the venue, what's the nature of the ceremony, who's going to be involved. And we have come to those common understandings using human language. And she totally failed to see the irony and the contradiction in her position of what she was saying. If you ever read an author or listen to a professor or any other person who's advocating this idea, who is trying to communicate the idea to you that human language is inadequate to communicate an idea. You hear what I just said? If they're trying to communicate the idea to you that human language is inadequate to communicate an idea, they have just falsified their own argument. Their own argument. We all communicate successfully using human language. John Mark Comer, in his book Live No Lies, puts it this way. The writers of the Bible did not view things like how we should spend our money, who we sleep with, or even the resurrection of Jesus from the dead as opinion or conjecture. They viewed them as reality, knowable reality. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Paul wrote, I know whom I have believed. We think of faith as something for religious people, but all of us live by faith. To have faith in something is simply to live as if it's true. It means to put your trust in something or someone and remain loyal to it. The question isn't, do you have faith? But who or what do you have faith in? Jesus and the scripture writers wanted us to have faith in Jesus and their teachings of faith that is based on knowledge of reality. Yes, the Bible is clear. Yes, the average person can understand it. It may take a little work, might take a little study, it might take a little time. We have to understand the biblical teaching about us is that God has created us in His image with the capacity for understanding and communication, with the ability to communicate with us and with Him. The Hebrew writer says, God is has spoken. Has he spoken in vain? No, he has not. He has spoken to us because he made us to understand what he said and communicate back to him. In our church, in many churches, but certainly in our church, we have a very high view of Scripture. The Bible and the Bible alone is our only rule of faith and practice. The Bible is the Word of God, yea, the very words of God, inerrant and infallible. To elevate the Bible to that position is not to detract from God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit in any way, because these words are their words. These words are God's Word, a part of who He is. When we say yes to the Bible fully and completely, we are saying yes to God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you today for your word. We recognize and affirm that your Holy Spirit was involved in the very production of these gospels, of these letters, even the Old Testament that Jesus said, those words cannot be broken. It's all produced by the Holy Spirit, and then your providence brought these letters and books together and have preserved them for us today. 
We say yes to your word. We are totally submitted to its authority in our lives. We will read it, study it, learn it, teach it, submit to it, live by it, and be transformed through it, through the work of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.